Father, as we come to you right now, I do want to thank you for the evening and for the opportunity that we have to be together. Thank you, Father, for the truths that we're going to share tonight. And Father, once again, we need your illumination to be able to see what you have for us and it not be just information. It's going to be solid. It's going to be clear information right out of the Word. But Father, we're asking you to take your inspired Word and illumine that in our hearts that we might be able to see it from your perspective. And so, Father, as we have many things going on in our lives in these days, I pray for the next hour or so that you'll just give us a special ability uh, to cause our undivided attention to be focused tonight in this area of our study. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. As we move on into our study now, we are, as I shared in an email this week, we are now at the heart of our study as we talk about being the person that God would have us to be. Now, all that we talked about and we have talked about up until this time has been groundwork and foundational work in preparation for what we do tonight and for the next weeks together. And so tonight, as we get into this study on how to receive truth, we're going to talk about some of the barriers that keeps us from receiving truth more clearly and how this all fits together. Now, as we look tonight, some of you have been able to figure out your flesh pattern. We've talked about those three flesh patterns in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and some of you have been able to figure out what your flesh pattern is. Some of you are still not sure, and some of you think you're all three. Well, we all have difficulties in all three of those areas, but typically one of those is our real hang-up. It's the area that really causes us difficulty. Now, if you have been unable to nail down your flesh pattern, there's one of three reasons why that's so. And, and if you'll notice on the back side of your study guide tonight, there's a lot of uh, free space there. So there's going to be some things I'm going to be talking about tonight that are not on the screen, not in your notes. And if you want to jot down a few things just to have them, that space there is available. But one of three reasons why you maybe haven't nailed down your flesh pattern. First of all, first reason would be spiritual stability. Spiritual stability. What I mean by that is you were raised in a home that was spiritually stable. Your mom and dad went to church or the family went to church and, and they walked with the Lord. Uh, maybe in some cases your, your family didn't necessarily go to church. Maybe they didn't walk with the Lord, but it was still a stable environment. There wasn't a lot of caustic activity. There wasn't a lot of harsh words shared. And because of the stability in your home when you were growing up, any etching that happened maybe in a moment of somebody saying something off color or out of the way, that's all been dealt with over time as you have grown in the Lord. Another reason why you maybe have not nailed down your flesh pattern is because of spiritual blindness. You're simply unable or unwilling to admit that one of these is your flesh pattern. You've come close there, but you've just not been willing to be honest with yourself and so you just uh, don't want to say that. A third reason, because of spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. Uh, you've, you've got a flesh pattern, but you all, you, you've already been on and you continue to be on a regimen of spiritual growth through personal Bible study, Sunday school and church. You're reading some good solid uh, literature, solid biblical literature and you're on a path of spiritual maturity and you truly have put the past in the past. And it's not bothering you anymore. You think about it every now, but it doesn't, it doesn't bother you like you once did. And so as you, as you think about your spiritual uh, maturity and your spiritual growth, uh, I believe that all of us have one of these flesh patterns, but it could be that uh, the reason why you haven't nailed it down or you've nailed it down and it's past you, it doesn't uh, really uh, dog your steps these days and so it's not as big an issue as maybe I've made it out to be in your life. 
Now you see in your notes, we have talked about those three flesh patterns, and let's think about now what they are. They're not written there in your notes, but let's, hopefully by now we're having them as in our mind. Say these with me. They are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now those are the three flesh patterns that John talks about and wrote about in the first John letter. Now if you'll notice there in your study guide, I've listed the 10 items that are from each of the, you might say the conclusion or the concluding point of each of those three flesh pattern studies. And what we want to see there is, this is kind of a, a summary of what the Holy Spirit is building into our lives. We could say that the Holy Spirit is building at least 10 spiritual disciplines into our lives. I'm not saying these are the only 10, that certainly would be saying too much. But I think it would be safe to say he's building these 10 into our lives. And so as you look at these, the first three relate to the first study on the lust of the flesh. The second three relate to our second study on the lust of the eyes. And the last four then deal with our study that we closed with last Sunday night in pride of life, which manifests itself in bitterness. So let's look at these 10 just by way of review. They're not on the screen. They're just there in your notes. He's building into our lives transparency, morality and purity, and true life within the framework of God. He's building into our lives giving, contentment and financial freedom, and true life within God's provision. That was the first half of last Sunday night study. And then we close with, he's building into our lives thankfulness, gratefulness, patience, and I, I put some extra words here because patience is not just putting up with things until they get better. Patience actually, from a biblical point of view, means endurance. It is persevering through, it's long suffering. And it's persevering through a situation, not just twiddling your thumbs, sitting in your lazy boy, hoping things are going to get better. It's pressing on through even the face of difficulty. And then number 10 there is true life within the sovereignty of God. Now as we look at this, we're going to be uh, spending some time here uh, talking before we get too far into this, but we are in this study now on acceptance. As we look into our study night and tonight and at least next Sunday night and maybe even a third study. We'll just kind of see how far we get next Sunday night. This acceptance portion of these seven areas that we're now launching into is huge. It is critical to our understanding who we are in Christ and being the person that God would have us to be. And so our goal tonight then is to see how that we are accepted in Jesus Christ. How that God sees us and that we see ourselves as He sees us rather than the way we see ourselves from way, the way we were. Now we talked about who we were and we have the reason why it was important for us to spend all that time talking about who we were is because the Holy Spirit is building into our lives the very opposite of who we were before we gave our lives to Christ. And the reason why that's important is if we get in His way, if we frustrate Him, we interfere or reject what He's doing in our lives in transforming us and making us more into the image of Jesus Christ, then this Christian life is going to be a, a lot more rocky road, a lot more bumpy road than it needs to be. And sometimes what's going on in our lives, we are frustrating the Holy Spirit. We are, we are bumping up against and we are not willing to agree with what He's doing in our lives. And like any kind of growth and like any kind of improvement, it, it's painful sometimes. When He kind of peels back the hide, so to speak, and we see ourselves for the way we were, uh, that's, a, that's a difficult picture to embrace. But he's building in our lives these 10 things and more. Now, as we think about accepting ourselves, if we don't accept ourselves for who we are, here's three things I think will happen. These are not in your notes, just listen. We will never be able to love other people with a God kind of love. If we don't see ourselves as loved by God and accepted in Jesus Christ, 
We won't be able to love other people like we need to love them. We won't be able to have any kind of lasting peace. It's interesting that Jesus said the world can give us peace. But it's a fleeting peace. It's not lasting. Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives you, my peace I give you. So he said there, the world can give you a measure of peace, but it's fleeting. It doesn't last. But when he gives you peace, when he sets you free, then you have an everlasting peace in that relationship that you have with Christ. And thirdly, another reason, if you, if you don't accept who you are in Jesus Christ, I don't believe you'll be able to love your kids and other people the way they need to be loved. Because you'll always be kind of looking and, and loving through your own weaknesses and through your own difficulties. And so we need to accept ourselves for the way we are. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, Brother Tom, hold it. What about those people that we refer to as being mentally challenged? Are they to accept themselves the way they are? Didn't God make some kind of mistake there? Well, the folks that I know of who are mentally challenged have several things in common. First of all, they are grateful for about anything that you do for them. I mean, for, for some of these folks that are mentally challenged, going to Sonic or going to McDonald's is the same as going to Disney World. They're just so grateful for the smallest things. They have an unlimited amount of love. They just seem to overflow with love. They are appreciative of the smallest token that you do for them, and they're just beaming with life. So you tell me, who's really the mentally challenged? You see, we are the ones that are frustrated a lot of times with life. We are the ones that can't love the way we need to love. We are the ones that we seem to have, we need to have more and more and more to make us happy. And so really, who's mentally challenged? Is it them or is it us? I, I think it'd be safe to say we could use a whole lot more love and appreciation and gratitude and gratefulness uh, that some of these folks seem to exhibit every day of their life. And so what we're seeking to do in these days is find out how God has made us, how God has made you to see yourself as accepted in Jesus Christ and to grow in that relationship. Well, tonight then we do look at acceptance. And just as a reminder, these seven areas that we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks, acceptance, authority, responsibility, ownership, motivation, freedom, and growth. And in my personal opinion, acceptance is the biggie. If we don't get this one right, if we don't get this settled on the acceptance and seeing ourselves as accepted in Jesus Christ, then the other six really won't matter. And we won't be able to appreciate them and apply those things in our lives. And so we're looking tonight then at this very important area of acceptance. Now the reason why this is such a key to being the person that God would have us to be is the opposite of acceptance is what? Rejection. And nobody wants to be rejected. In fact, we will do as humans and even as Christians, we will do whatever we can do to avoid being rejected. In fact, we'll do whatever we can do to be accepted in the group, in the club, whatever. This is what makes teenage boys and men do criminal acts to be accepted in a group, in a gang. I, I don't know what kind of clubs you've been involved in, but it is amazing what men will subject themselves to as initiation rites just to be accepted in a club. Just to have a bunch of guys say, we accept you. They would never do that in their right mind. But to be accepted in the, in the fraternity, in the, in the group that they want to be a part of, 
They'll do certain things. It's what makes young ladies give themselves over to promiscuity. Because they want to be accepted. They want to be loved by a person of the opposite sex. Especially they'll do that if they were rejected by their dad. They want to be accepted. And they want to know that they are lovable. It's what makes a beautiful woman look in a mirror and see ugly. Many of the women that we look at, the, the Miss America type ladies, the, the queens, the, the people that we think of, who are beautiful women, when they look in the mirror, they don't see the same person that we see. We see them as beautiful. Many of these ladies see themselves as ugly, as fat. It's the reason why they don't ever eat. Because they really think they're not, are not pretty. And it's because of this whole area of them not being accepted. They haven't accepted themselves as a unique creation of God. They look at themselves that way. It's what makes workaholics out of business people. They're trying to prove their worth to themselves. Maybe to a dad who said you'll never amount to anything. Or to the company that said... We'll give you a chance, but you had better prove your worth. And, and they turn into workaholics. The flip side of that is what makes slothful people give their poor, it, poor work ethic. They never could do anything right when they were growing up. And so what they say is, why even try? What's the use? I can't do it well enough. I never could do it right. Why even give it a try? It's what corrupts otherwise good politicians. Otherwise good politicians, many of them, I'm convinced, and I've known some good ones, they get elected and they run for office because they really believe they can change things for the good. And they go into office with the idea, I want, I have this uh, this piece of legislation, I have this vision for our country or our city or our county or whatever. And these are the things that I want to see enacted. And, and when they get into office before long, what do they start thinking about? Getting reelected. And the worst form of rejection for a politician is to lose the next election or to be thrown out of office. This is why the guy in Egypt took so long to finally give up. He didn't want to be thrown out of his position by the people. And the worst form of rejection for a politician is to be voted out of office. And so rather than serve the people with a desire, I'm going to serve the people as God would have me to serve them. And if I get voted out doing the right thing, then so be it. And they shelve that, they set that aside, all for the, the task of getting reelected. And it corrupts. This whole idea of rejection and acceptance corrupts many good politicians. It's what makes dictators out of people who could otherwise be catalysts for change. Rather than being, and most dictators are very good communicators. Have you noticed that? They have a command of, 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 of the language. They can woo the people. And rather than being catalysts for change for good, they become dictators because they're so inferior, they're so insecure, the only thing that they can do to keep their position is by either killing or belittling other people, their fellow constituents. This whole idea of, of rejection is what leads many men into pornography. <coughs> many of the men who immerse themselves in pornography do so because they have been rejected by an important woman in their life. It could have been their mother, a grandmother. It could have been a girlfriend, maybe even their wife. 
but within the pages of pornographic literature and on the pornographic websites on the internet, they believe they have found a safe environment. They have a so-called relationship with a woman who will never reject them, who will accept them just the way they are. She'll never laugh at him. She'll never say you're unlovely. They'll never even ever meet. But in the safety, so-called, of that situation, he believes he's having a relationship. And all the while doing so, he doesn't realize he's destroying his own mind and destroying his own body. We found that in the Lust of the Flesh study. It's also this high idea of rejection, acceptance. It's what leads people to leave the comforts of marriage and a family and sleep in flea-bitten, cheap hotels. They believe they've found someone who will totally accept them for just the way they are. And they will sacrifice a comfortable bed, their reputation, their career, their family. They'll forsake it all just to be accepted by somebody. It's also the reason why we don't witness any more than we do. We don't want to be rejected. We don't want to feel rejected. We know if we go into somebody's home and we share with them the message of Jesus Christ, it's possible that they're going to say, get out of my house. I don't want to hear about your Jesus. I don't want to hear about your church. Get out of here. And since we don't want to be rejected and we'll do anything we can do to experience acceptance, the enemy is obliged to help us remain silent. For all this, all these reasons and more, this thing is huge. Rejection permeates every fabric of society. Acceptance and its counterpart rejection is an enormous problem. And if you don't hear anything else I say tonight, if you don't remember anything else tonight when you leave here, I want you to hear this. On the authority of the Word of God, you, if you are a Christian, you have been accepted in Jesus Christ. Look what it says here. Look what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. Jesus Christ and His work on the cross and the relationship that you now have in Jesus Christ as a result of what He did on the cross and your prayer of asking God to take what Jesus did on that cross and apply that to your lives, you have been accepted in Jesus Christ. You don't have to run around the world trying to gain the world's acceptance because you have been accepted in the Lord. Now look with me, if you're there in Ephesians, go with me to Matthew chapter 22. We talked earlier just a few moments ago about if we don't understand who we are in Christ, and haven't been uh, really, we haven't really accepted ourselves as who we are in Christ. And there's so much more we're going to say about that even yet tonight. I said just a moment ago, we won't be able to love other people like we need to love them with a God kind of love. Unless we really understand who we are in Christ. Look what um, we have here in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37. 
And what we find here, we're finding three people that we need to love. Let's see if we can find them. And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, hopefully the first one's easy to figure out. Who are we supposed to love first? The Lord your God. Love the Lord, verse 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, or, or heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. It's, it's a little bit different, different passages. We talked about the mind, the will, the emotions. And so in order for us to fully love God, we need to understand who we are in Christ. Okay, who's the second person we are to love? Now this one's a little trickier. There you go. It's tough, isn't it? Do we love ourselves? That sounds pretty self-centered, doesn't it? Jesus said you're to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, can you really love your neighbor until you love yourself? You see, not until, and again, I know that sounds kind of conceited, like you look in the mirror and say, I love you. That's not, what <laughs> not quite what I'm talking about here. It's the idea is when we understand how God loves us and we fully appreciate and accept His love in our lives and how He made us, how He fearfully and wonderfully made us, when we fully accept who we are in Christ, then we're able to have a God kind of love and then we're able then to even love God the way we're supposed to here and then we're able to love our neighbor. But until we get this centerpiece figured out, until we get this love and acceptance of ourselves before God, we can't really even love God the way we're supposed to. And we certainly can't love our neighbor like we're supposed to. So this thing of acceptance and accepting ourselves as who we are in Christ is huge to our walk with the Lord and our interacting with society. Well. Let's look at this definition. There on your study guide, we want to come to a definition of acceptance. What does it mean here? Just fill in the blanks here as it's on the screen as it pops up for you there. It means to receive with approval or favor. To receive as true, valid, proper. To receive with satisfaction. So jot that down. To receive with approval or favor. To receive as true, valid, proper. To receive with satisfaction. The idea of making us accepted in Jesus Christ. Now when I ask you a question, I'm not asking for an audible answer. This is, this is one for the heart. Is there something about you that you would change if you could. Again, I'm not asking for an answer. This is inside. Is there something about you that you could change, that you would change if you could? Now, 99.9% .9 of you said, yes, there is something. There is something I'd like to change. The, uh, the difficult spot we find ourselves in is we really can't change ourselves. And guys, I, I think you've probably figured this out by now. You can't change her <laughs> like you'd like her to change. And ladies, you, you can't change him. You've been trying. For years you've been trying. And you're saying, and I'm not giving up yet. I, but, <laughs> There are things about your kids you can't change. You haven't hit them hard enough. I haven't hit them hard. We don't even go there right now. But you say, well, if we, can't, if we can't change, then we're hopeless. No. It's that you can't change. You can't do the changing. It's God that does the changing. 
You see, gang, when we get to the point that we can accept ourselves for the way God has made us, and we can even accept, as difficult as it may be, to accept some of the paths we've traveled in life, God then somehow, miraculously, we, we give him some kind of, a, 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 in a way that I don't quite understand, we somehow release him to do the changing that only he can do. But as long as we get in the way, we're frustrating his activity in our lives, in the lives of our spouse, in the lives of our kids. And the best thing we can do is get in on what God's doing. Stay in fellowship with him. Stay in tune with him. Stay in his word. Keep growing and allow him to do the work in his timing and in his way. And over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about some of the areas where God is seeking to do change in each of our lives. Well, let's take it then to point one here on our study guide and the basis for acceptance. We just read it there in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. So if you would, just fill that in there in your outline. Just add that Ephesians 1, 3 through 6 reference. Because the basis for acceptance is Jesus Christ. He is the one that makes us acceptable. He is the one that did the work that makes us acceptable to God. We are accepted in the beloved. In most of your translations, the word beloved there in the English translation is capitalized. Why is it capitalized? Because Jesus is the beloved. And we are accepted in Him. Now go with me to, uh, you're there in Matthew chapter 22 or so, go with me to Luke chapter 1. Now what is interesting about this word accepted is it's only found there in the Ephesians passage and in Luke chapter 1. Only two times this word is found in our Bible, this idea of being accepted. There in Ephesians 1.6, here in Luke 1.28. Now if you would, drop in at verse 26, Luke 1.26. This is the Christmas story, isn't it? Look what it says here. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to, by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, we're now in verse 28, Luke 1, 28. The angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. There's our word right there. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Mary was accepted by God. Now, if we're not careful, we will go down the path of our friends that attend another church, another location, and we will exalt and we will worship Mary. As though Mary made herself somehow through her own effort and through her own ability, made herself acceptable to God. Do you kind of see how, how folks go down that path? They revere Mary. They even worship Mary to believe that she has somehow worked her way up to a, a, a state of spiritual maturity and perfection that she therefore was acceptable to God. Now Mary was a precious woman. She was a virgin. She was a lady who, who loved God and walked with God. But the point I need you to see here. It's God that made her acceptable. Not that she somehow worked her way up into a state of perfection whereby God had to use her because she was so perfect. He made her acceptable. In fact, the word says that he graced her is what it says there grammatically. And I'll, here's what I want you to see. If you can do this. Imagine how God poured out his divine favor on Mary and said to her, I accept you. If you can see that, that's exactly how he sees you. Now that you've given your life to Christ. 
I want to tell you, that's powerful. Because God has so worked in her life to bring her to a point of, of, of just, just doing a work, a divine favor on her life, and made her acceptable. God, through Jesus Christ on the cross, made you acceptable. And friends, I want to tell you, if you can embrace that truth, then exactly the same way that God looked at the Virgin Mary, He looks at you through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, whereby you are accepted in the blood. And you're not junk. You're not stupid. I don't care who said that. You're not worthless. You are a child of God. You are special. Just like Mary was a special recipient of the grace of God, you have been a special recipient of the grace of God. And we need to relish in that reality. We need to live in that truth. The reason why that's so important is because grace does not come from us. It comes from God. Same way for Mary, same way for us. For by grace, you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. He loves you just like he loved her and chose her and used her in a divine way. And God wants to use you. He wants to use you in a special way. He has made you acceptable to him. By His grace, through Christ on the cross. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's powerful. Well, the reason why that's so important is because of the way the world seeks to administer acceptance. Look at these on your notes here. The world's basis for acceptance, first of all, is performance. You've heard this phrase before. You'll probably hear it again. We call it performance-based acceptance. The world says, we'll accept you if you perform for us. If you do a good job, we'll accept you. If you don't do a good job, we don't accept you. They also accept us on the basis of appearance. On the basis of appearance. If I like the way you look, then I accept you. If I don't like the way you look, I don't accept you. This is the rat race that our kids are in all the time. Trying to keep up with the fashion. Trying to keep up with the style. If you wear the right kind of clothes, then we'll accept you. If you don't, we don't accept you. The third is status. This is the way the world seeks to administer. And if we try to gain acceptance on the basis of the world, we are going to be like the proverbial gerbil in the cage, always running, trying to get the world's acceptance. And the difficulty is, just about the time we get acceptance from the world, they change the rules. Now, as a guy, I can say this, but this whole fashion thing is, is deplorable. Who is it that's out there deciding what's the fashion today? It's all about acceptance, folks. And if your kids go to school without wearing the cool clothes, what's happening? They get rejected. They're not in the cool group. They'd only get invited to the cool parties. But if your kids, and you're going to teach them this, if your kids can understand they are accepted in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what Billy and Sarah and Sally at school say about them. They're going to have to be tough, and we're going to talk about how to stand alone and how to stand up even when all their friends are heading in the wrong direction. We're going to get to there. But if you teach them and share with them how that they are accepted in Jesus Christ, then they, they won't, this won't scar them as deeply as it might otherwise. It's still going to hurt when they're laughed at, when they're kidded about, when, when there's whispers behind the back, it hurts. But it won't hurt near as badly if you'll talk to them and share with them that you're accepted in Jesus Christ. 
And let's notice, secondly, all the principal barrier to acceptance. By now we know what that is. The principal barrier is rejection. The principal barrier is rejection. Because none of us wants to be rejected. We'll do whatever we can do to be accepted, to be in the club, to be in the group, to be invited to the cool parties. And so because we want to be accepted, the barrier to acceptance is rejection. Because the world is going to continue to reject us. And I want to tell you, we're living in a day when if you stand for Jesus Christ, you are going to be rejected just on account. You don't have to say a word other than say, I'm a Christian. Okay, you're an outcast. You're, you're suspect. And it's going to take some, it's going to take some true grit. It's going to take some thick skin and some spiritual maturity to stand tall for Jesus Christ in our day. It's getting more and more difficult to take mission trips because more and more the world is against those who have the message of the, of the cross. But here at Longview, we're going to keep going. Till he comes, we're going to keep going. And we're going to keep sharing the gospel wherever we can. Now, there are two forms of rejection. We want to talk about these for a little bit. Try to get a handle on these. And again, you've got that white space there. If you want to jot down some, some of the things, some things I'm going to share with you are there in your notes. Some is just for your own personal note taking. The first form of rejection is what we call just straight out, straightforward rejection. We call that overt rejection. Overt or straightforward rejection comes in the form of abuse. Whether it's mental abuse or physical abuse or verbal abuse or sexual abuse, it's just straight out rejection. It's overt. Harsh words is another form of rejection, or another form of this straightforward rejection. Name-calling. Probably all of us were called some kind of a name. I, I could take you to a point right now. I can, I'm right there in my mind in the driveway where this kid called me this name. That was over 50 years ago, and I can still remember that. I've forgiven him. I can't remember Brother Wayne's points in his sermon this morning, but I can remember what that guy said to me 50 years ago. Because it hurts. Harsh words, they cut deep. When you actually hear your parents say, you were not wanted. I'll tell you, we've got kids that have heard that. Some of you have heard that. Some of you heard that and you didn't mean to hear it. You, you weren't supposed to hear it. Your mom and your dad were in there at the dining room table talking one night over a cup of coffee. And they said, if it wasn't for that one, we'd be better off financially and you're that, uh, you're that one. That's a form of rejection. When you're not able to do anything right, or you couldn't do it well enough, that's another form of straightforward rejection. Let's talk about some subtle rejections. Several here if you want to jot down some of these one or two words. Just because these subtle ways of experiencing rejection are in often ways more painful than the straight out direct words or actions. First one is just write down the word disappointments. A series of disappointments. This is, a, this is a situation what happens when your mom or your dad or, or both of them, they promise to be at your recital or they promise to be at your ball game or they promise to be at your graduation. And it wasn't they just missed one time. They missed them over and over and over again. And those disappointments started piling up and they started being etched into your mind. And what you said is, my mom and dad don't love me. Now, we, we need to talk about this one just for a moment. Because things come up, don't they? We can't be two places at one time. As I was reviewing these notes even this morning, I was thinking of a time many, many years ago when I was pastoring in Indiana, and we were sitting down, and it was Christmas Eve, and we were there around the Christmas tree, and we're getting ready to unwrap the presents, and we get the phone call. 
And it's the phone call of somebody dying at the church. And I'm the pastor. There's my wife. There's my son. We're getting ready to have Christmas. What do I do? Uh, I'll see you in the morning. It doesn't work that way in the ministry. I went to that house that night, and, and I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't always do things right. I don't, don't want to put myself up as any kind of I do all things right all the time. But many, many years before that event, I sat my wife down, and I sat my son down, and I said, this is the ministry that we have, that God's called us into. And this is the work that we've been called into to minister to people. And there are going to be times that I'm going to have to leave or, or not be able to keep a promise that I made to you. And I want to tell you, if I ever have to do that, it's not because I don't love you. It's not because I don't value you. It's because that God has called us to be in this ministry and we're in this thing together. And I left the house that night and I went to care for that family. And as far as I know, unless I'm blinded, it never affected my wife one bit. It didn't affect our son one bit. In fact, I've shared, you know, when my son was called in the ministry, I thought if any kid was called in the ministry, it's got to be a preacher's kid because they have seen the bad side of the ministry, warts and all. And if a preacher's kid will be agreeable to go into the ministry, it's got to be a call of God. Now, the way you translate that to yourself there are going to be times you can't be at two places at one time. In fact, it's impossible. But if you explain to your kids and explain to your wife, honey, there's going to be those times that, that comes up. And it's not because I don't love you. It's not because I'm just a, a, a jerk or a bad dad. I, just, I hope you understand I have other responsibilities as well. And if you will communicate, and, and I want to tell you again, they are not going to pick up on that unless you actually say it with your mouth. You might say, well, they ought to understand that. They don't. You've got to actually say it. Communicate with your kids. Talk with your wife. Talk with your husband. And, and make it clear so that when those things happen, disappointments. Well, let's move on. We've got to go. Abandonment is another form of subtle rejection. Maybe your parents just didn't have time for you. Maybe your parents were divorced when you were young and you just felt somehow you were responsible for that. And you just felt abandoned. Maybe one of your parents worked sun up to sundown to provide you stuff, things, when in reality, if, you could, if they would have asked you and you could have talked to them, you would have said, I don't want the stuff. I want you. I'd rather have you home talking to me. It's the whole background behind the song, The Cat's in the Cradle. Man, that song, man, it gets my heart. It makes me think every time I hear it. Parents are too busy is another form of subtle rejection. Parents are just too busy. One of the most damaging forms of rejection for a child is for them to feel that their parents just do not care or they're too busy for them. In fact, many children will actually disobey and suffer discipline just to get the attention of their parents. Sometimes kids at school will goof up, mess up, be a rowdy kid just to try to get some attention from somebody. And what's funny is, or what's difficult is, if, if that child is not disciplined correctly, even that will be viewed as a form of rejection. Because they tried to get your attention, they know they're messing up, and yet you don't even correct them in the area that they're messing up, and they will even view that as a form of rejection. And we've all heard of those times when a person, a child, it gets so frustrated because mom and dad was too busy, they carry out the ultimate form of rejection in murdering their own parents. It's because parents didn't have time for them. Adoption is another form of subtle rejection. Now, we gladly and proudly and very clearly
promote adoption over abortion. We, we just, we exalt that. We, we believe adoption is a tremendous, tremendous thing. But the same token for those of you who have been adopted. It's possible somewhere in, in the background of your life, there's been those thoughts. Mom really didn't love me or she'd have kept me. She'd have cared for me. She wouldn't have put me on the doorstep. She wouldn't have given me over to a foster home if she really loved me. And so we have to see ourselves as accepted to Jesus Christ. Death, death of a parent is a form of subtle rejection. Maybe one or both of your parents died many years ago, maybe in a traffic accident, whatever, and, and they left you, and, there, and, there's, and there's abandonment feelings there. That's a form of subtle rejection. Lack of proper affection is another form of subtle rejection. Maybe as a result of you being born premature, or maybe because your mother had difficulties in childbearing, she didn't get to be with you and didn't get to hold you, and you, you lacked that very important kind of love and affection in those first important weeks and months, and, and there's a sense of rejection there. We mentioned this a while ago, but just feelings of being unwanted. Children who are a surprise. And uh-oh. Can many times feel rejected, unwanted. Performance-based acceptance is another form of subtle rejection. Now this one's going to be hard to, hard to really embrace, and really, you have to think about this one, overprotection or smothering your children is a form of rejection. It's actually saying to your child, you're not smart enough to make any decisions for yourself, so I'm going to make all of them for you. And you smother them, and that's a form of rejection. Sibling rivalry is another form of subtle rejection where you have parents that are comparing kids to kids and you didn't do it as well as Billy did, you didn't do it as good as Sally did and all that. And some of you went through that going to school, especially if you had an older brother or sister. I can relate to that. And, and, and when you come up into school, you know, your, your, your brother or your sister was the straight A student. Why is it always that way? And you, and, and, well, you didn't do it as well as and that's tough. That's a form of rejection. One more, and we're going to move on. Relocation can be a form of rejection. Whether it's a relocation because of employment or because of a military career, the children have to be relocated to a different city, to a different school, a school that they move from a school that they, they see as safe and fun and and that's just, that's, that's, that's where we go to school. And now we got to go to a new school. And we got to find a new home and a new set of friends and a new church. And it takes uh, some difficulties. You've probably known enough pastors to know that many times pastors' kids have difficulty in this time. Especially with, with pastors who've had to leave and maybe go to places every two or three years. It's, it's very difficult on the kids. Because basically what they're saying is, if they never actually say these words in their heart, they're saying, nobody asked me. It didn't involve me in this conversation. They just said, get in the car. We're moving. Just be quiet. Go. We're with you. Go with us. And it's a form of rejection. Well, the real, real difficulty about all this Charles Solomon says in his book, The Rejection Syndrome, a person who has been rejected will often reject himself or herself even if they do it unconsciously and will often reject others in the same way they were rejected. This permeates every area of life and this whole idea of acceptance is huge. And as we understand who we are in Christ and that we are accepted in Jesus Christ and that God looks at us 
just the way he looked at Mary, then we can deal with these things. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm not saying you're a horrible person. What I am saying is if any of those things that I just shared with you touched a nerve in your heart, I'm giving you the salve of how to meet that issue. All that in the past, put it in the past. You can't change it. You can't go back there. You can't undo it. You can't back up time. Leave it in the past. Realize you've been accepted in Jesus Christ and go with that. Again, talking and quoting from Chuck Solomon. He says that rejection can happen in all six stages of life. In the mature years, in the middle years, in the young adult years, in the youth years, the childhood years, and even in the prenatal months. Professionals tell us that babies in the womb can sense whether they're being accepted or rejected. And regardless of where you experienced rejection, where that happened for you, the, the mode of the rejection, the answer is the same for all of us. I have been accepted in Jesus Christ. I have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ, Paul said in Romans chapter 8. And let me tell you, hold on to this. When you are tempted to look back, when you are tempted to go back to an event that you cannot change and you cannot undo, when the enemy tempts you and tries you to go back, I'm begging you, I'm asking you, stop at the cross and go no further. Stop there. Because the Word says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. If you can embrace that, what we're saying is the person you used to be is what? is dead. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I do live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And just like he made Mary acceptable, he made you acceptable in Jesus Christ. And the person that you were is history. The person you are is this chosen, special creation of God, a recipient of His divine grace. And folks, it's not enough just to understand that and understand that you've been rejected and that now you're accepted. You've got to apply that every day of your life until it just becomes second nature. You know, if you were sick, or if you had a laceration, and you went to the doctor, and he gave you some medication to make you feel better, and he told you to put that medication on every hour, on the hour, on the dot, you'd do it to get better with you. But for some reason, we want spiritual, the spiritual sab to happen right now. Fix us and let's, okay, let's put all, every day. If you have to apply the spiritual salve of the truth to your life every day, every moment of every day until it becomes second nature, that's what you're going to have to do. To know who you are in Christ to know that you are accepted in the beloved and the person that you used to be is no more. He's been crucified. She's been crucified with Christ and now you're new in Christ. Now the reason why all that's important, there's a, there's a, this is not on your notes, but it's on the screen. Let's look at this graphic. Uh, we talked about this graphic a couple of weeks ago and we talked about our body, soul, spirit. And we talked about our soul being further divided up into mind, will, and emotion. The reason why all this is, is key here is because we're such emotional people. I don't mean we cry all the time. That's not what I mean. 
but we make a lot of emotional decisions. And the reason why what I'm talking about is so important is if we're not careful, we'll forget that the only spiritual peroxide we have for our minds is truth. We can't unzip our head and pour in the peroxide. It's truth that cleans our mind. And we are such emotional people. Catch this. It takes our mind working with our will, applying truth from the Word of God to overpower emotion. Because emotion by itself, running rampant, will say, I don't feel lovely. I don't feel accepted. I don't feel like God is going to use me. And every time we go down that road, we've got to apply the salve of the word. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's truth, folks. It takes the mind and the, and the will operating on the truth of the word of God to overpower emotion and to put it in its place. Well, quickly, let's move on to points three, four, and five. We can do this. Let's look at these relationships where acceptance is important. Let's just kind of walk down through them. Relationships where acceptance is important. Certainly God, the relationship we have with God. If we don't understand how we're accepted in Jesus Christ, then our relationship with Him is going to be all askew. Our relationship with ourself, just, just our body, our, our mind, and all this. We, I know you talk to yourself. So that relationship that you have with The relationship you have with family. The relationship you have with church, with your pastors, with your teachers, with fellow church members. If, if you don't have, have any idea who you are in Christ, it's going to affect the relationships you have with your fellow church members. How about your friends? We all have friends that are difficult to deal with. But if we know who we are in Christ, it doesn't matter what they say about us. It's important what God says about us. How about the kids at school? Our classmates, our teacher, our principal, we, 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 we love these folks. Some of these folks we endure, but, but it's folks at school. How about folks at work? Man, I could talk to you till midnight about some of the people I've worked with down through the years as a pipe fitter, as a plumber. It, we don't even want to go there. The people that you have to deal with. How about neighbors and other associates? Some of us have neighbors, just great neighbors. Some of us have neighbors that just frustrate the fire out of us. But if we know who we are in Christ, that affects that. How about a future acquaintance or a future spouse? For those of you who are not married. What about future goals, plans, and dreams? If you think you're junk, if you think you can't accomplish anything, you never can do anything right, certainly that's going to affect your plans, your goals, your dreams. Let's look at some problems related to acceptance. We might come back to these in future studies, but let's, let's get these in here. Self-criticism. Self-criticism. I said a couple of Sunday nights ago, negative criticism, negative self-talk is very debilitating. I'm not talking about, I'm not saying the flip side of that as you're standing in the mirror and saying you're the greatest in the world, but, but certainly positive self-talk is better than negative self-talk. Shyness can many times be a problem. People just become shy. Depression. The Bible says anxiety, anxiety of the heart causes depression. And so if we don't accept ourselves for who we are in Christ, we certainly can go down the road of depression. Irrational behavior. Just doing things irrationally. Lack of trust. If we don't accept ourselves for who we are in Christ, it's going to affect our trust of other people. Even if they have proven themselves over and over and over again to be trustworthy, we'll have difficulty. Lack of love from your marriage partner, lack of love for your marriage partner. We, we talked about that a while ago. Extravagance. If, we're not, if we don't understand who we are in Christ, we might try to gain the world's acceptance by extravagance, by buying and, and, and acquiring a lot of things. Over-attention to self. 
can be another problem related to acceptance. Perfectionism can be another problem with, perfect, with acceptance. We have to do everything so perfectly, we never get anything done. The inability to trust God can be a problem with rejection. And number five, these resulting attitudes and actions. If your problem, if your lust, or excuse me, if your flesh pattern is the lust of the flesh, then again, the, the resulting attitude or actions is the inability to give and receive real love. If your problem is, your flesh pattern is the lust of the eyes, you'll be envious of other people. You want what they have. What do we call that? Covetousness, which is idolatry, the Bible says. We're envious of other people. And if pride of life is our flesh pattern, then we're going to have a kind of a schizophrenic life of inferiority, superiority, that, that whole thing. Well, that brings us to the end of our study tonight. And again, if you don't think of anything else, remember how much God loves you. It's not that He loves you because you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's that He made you lovable in Jesus Christ. On the back side of your study guide, just before you put that away, some of you already did, if you would, add, add this to your reading le uh, for next week. Add Genesis 11, 1 to 9. Add that as in addition to the things that you're reading for this week. Friends, God loves you. Don't let the enemy beat you up. Don't let thoughts and things of the past continue to dog your steps. This week, be the person that God would have you to be. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you right now, I want to thank you so much for the time we've had together. I'm looking forward even now to next Sunday night and the things we're going to be getting into there. Bless, Father, as we leave here, as we move on to other meetings, other appointments, as we go home, whatever it is that we're going to be doing this evening, may it all be Christ-honoring, for it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Good night.